Do you remember what happened on June 17th, 2015? I was 16 years old. I had just begun dating a boy I had a crush on. I was traveling the world, or really a small town in New York with a friend I had just met months prior. Life was exciting in a shiny way that can only be true of someone that young and naive. A month from then, I'd probably be back home in a rural town no one has ever heard of, right on the border of South Carolina. But now, June 17th, 2015, three hours away from my family home, Dylan Roof pulled into the parking lot of Emanuel AME, the oldest black church in the South. 911, what's the address of the emergency? Please, Emanuel Church is being people shot down here. Please send somebody right away. On June 17th, 2015, this, this is, is where room. he came. This yes. is where people were seated. Shot pastor, female is hiding under the table. Male is reloading. Dylan Roof, who walked into that church and then shot and killed nine parishioners who had invited him to pray with them. We had had a situation in the church as they were aware of, and that at this point, uh, that there were nine people that were deceased. Just stay quiet, okay? Just stay right where you are. <laughs> oh. It was a gasp that I'll never forget. Roof evaded capture for more than 12 hours. According to the warrant, Roof's father and uncle recognized him from the surveillance image released to the public and contacted the Charleston Police Department. In the days following June 17th, online users found a website registered to Roof. Amongst pictures of himself with Confederate and apartheid-era South Africa flags was his manifesto. He discussed the alt-right websites he had been radicalized on. He discussed his desire for a race war, and he indulged in his racist, anti-Semitic, and xenophobic views. In his manifesto, he wrote, We have no skinheads, no real KKK, no one doing anything but talking on the internet. Well, someone has to have the bravery to take it to the real world. And I guess that has to be me. Dylan Roof's attack on Emanuel AME reminds us of other white supremacist and white nationalist violence in the country. 1963's 16th Street Baptist Church bombing at the hands of the KKK, which took the lives of four young black girls. 2017's Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, where angry white men marched with swastikas and Confederate flags, even killing a counter-protester. 2021's insurrection at the Capitol, which we just don't talk about a lot. Did you know that riot was the first time the Confederate flag was ever flown in the U.S. Capitol building? The first time ever. Confederate soldiers didn't even get that close, but oh, here comes Billy Bob. These movements across history and across state lines all seemingly consist of the same men. White, cis, declining, and angry. Angry enough to call for the execution for the then sitting vice president. No less. Put all those names down yeah. and we start hunting them down one by one. Yeah. This pattern shapes the way we view conservative and, more extremely, alt-right factions. We view these spaces as one giant playground for men. Sweaty podcasts, deadly insurrections, alleged Zodiac killers who enjoy dinner with a man who insulted their wife. Donald, you're a sniveling coward and leave Heidi the hell alone. She get money, her body tea. She's super thick, she's super pretty. But we're not looking at the bigger picture. I am not allowed to say what's going to happen today because everyone's just gonna have to watch. I know what you're thinking. The violence of some alt-right white women is far overshadowed by that of certain alt-right white men. How unfair it is of me to equate the two. It's an entirely different problem. Alt-right white men stormed the Capitol. Some of them carry out lynchings, past and present, and they are the face of the white nationalist movement. 
not white women. And okay, yeah, even if those women did happen to be married to the likes of Joe Rogan or Josh Hawley or God forbid a Trump, it's not like they play any role in the dissemination and protection of their husband's ideology. <laughs> what are you new here? Sit down. Let's learn. Some white women have an interesting history as auxiliaries to the white supremacist cause. Despite not being able to vote, own land, or hold office, white women during the pre-Civil War era were still slave owners. As interviews from formerly enslaved people reveal, white women were trained in the ownership, discipline, and mastery of enslaved people, starting from birth. They were even gifted slaves sometimes for the shits and giggles of everyday life, but also for the dumps and chuckles of marriage or Christmas. Hallelujah, here's a person, let it snow. White women were taught how to punish slaves. They bought and sold them. In fact, Southern white women were invested in the institution of slavery the same way their white husbands were. But that was so long ago. Surely there's no white supremacy movement after slavery that held a sizable white woman demographic. Some of y'all about to be real mad at me, but it must be said. Let's see. Okay, the clan. During the first clan era, the white wives of clan members would sew membership costumes as well as loan their clothing for disguise purposes. Of course, not all of this work was voluntary being married to a violent racist, more than likely did not protect white women from the wrath of their husband. Some women did auxiliary work because they were forced. But during the resurgence of the Klan in the 1920s, white women joined the WKKK, a woman's only extension of the group in droves. Talk about girl bosses. More than half a million Protestant white women joined the group nationwide. And they did so not only with the desire to restore traditional values of gender, race, and sexuality, but it was because it was a cutesy way for them all to hang out and spend quality time with their gal pals. Like genuinely, ex-Klans women were interviewed in the 90s about their participation in the WKKK, and they showed no remorse for the violent terrorism that their group supported. Instead, one Klans woman talked about how fun and engaging it was, like, it was a book club or a game of field hockey. I don't know, what do white people play? <laughs> when women started joining the Klan in the 1920s, the landscape of identity that they were used to was already becoming destabilized. This was at a time post-World War I when their husbands were returning. Not only did these husbands feel as though they failed the test of manhood, but these husbands were also returning home to empty halls. And what's worse, empty kitchens. <coughs> Women were either still working to pick up the slack of absent men, or they were still funneling into the workforce in droves. Divorce rates were up, anxiety spread about the gays. And like so many different movements of angry white men, white people as a whole felt threatened. They felt disenfranchised, unheard. White women joined the WKKK because they believed in the Klan's message of restoring traditional values in religion, race, sexuality. There was, believe it or not, a sense of feminism in the Klan's women's cause. Not effective or intersectional feminism for obvious reasons, but feminism for themselves and themselves only. The conversation of feminism in white nationalist movements is important especially when discussing the wives of white supremacists. But for this video, I want to introduce you to the alt-right pipeline found in conservative feminine circles. We'll talk more about feminism itself in part two of this video series. The point is, Klan's women and men of the 1920s shared a very extensive list of enemies that they violently targeted, smeared, and organized against. K.M. Blee in 1991 stated, the mainstay of the 1920s clan was not the pathological individual, but a series of groups that tapped into the deep bigotry and racism of the white community. In this sense, the history of the 1920s clan, although distant in time, 
is frighteningly close in spirit to the pervasive strands of racism and unacknowledged privilege that exist among dominant groups in the United States today. Today, you say? But I thought Obama... Isn't it a sign of racial progress that a black man has the chance to be a war criminal, just like the rest of the United States presidents? Discrimination should be over! But y'all don't want to hear me, you just want to dance. This need to return to traditional values, to restore hierarchies of race and religion, sometimes even gender, creates a traceable thread between old white supremacist movements and new. And the demographics don't change as much as you think. White women haven't entirely fallen out of the white supremacist cause, even with the mass feminist protests, even with the worldwide movements. Whereas white wives of the past were sewing clan hoods for their husbands, white wives of the present schedule vineyard visits for their group after deadly neo-Nazi marches. Whereas white wives of the past spread clan ideology at family reunions, white wives of today are funneling in new inductees through TikTok and Instagram. The alt-right has a new face, but just how fresh is it? All this talking is exhausting. I need to pick me up. I'm not always a wine person, but when I am, it's gotta be Bright Tellers. It's, it's gotta be. Bright Tellers is so graciously sponsoring this video. I told you before, and I'm gonna stick beside it, wine is intimidating. It's one of the only drinks out there that requires a PhD to understand what you're getting. But Bright Cellars is the wine club that's making it easy to learn what you like. They have a quiz on their website that's only seven questions long. And girl, it's easy, it, it is easy and convenient. You can take it whenever and wherever you have spare time. Just answer honestly, submit the quiz, and Bright Sellers will pair you with your ideal matches. My favorite part about Bright Sellers is the information cards. These come in the wine box. Not only are they incredibly well designed, but they also give you tips on how best to serve your wine, what foods to pair with your bottle, and also some cool details about the flavor profile. And listen, even if you don't like a bottle suggestion, don't worry, your Bright Cellars concierge will replace it for you, easy as that. I get six bottles in my wine box, which is perfect for the holiday season so that I can share them with my friends and my family. I think a cool idea would even to be hold a secret Santa using the wine. You can try to figure out which taste profile your friends prefer based on their personality and you can use the cards as a guide. And look, Bright Sellers knows me very well. I am someone who wants to get maximally wine drunk with little to no, with little to no intrusion upon my taste buds. This, it, hold on. Doesn't taste like wine. It doesn't taste like wine at all. This is, literally my perfect wine. The truth is, I don't know much about wine, but that's kind of the point. I don't have to be an expert with Bright Cellars. I just tell them what I like and they will do all of the heavy lifting. And lucky for you, I've got the hookup. Thank you to Bright Cellars for giving my subscribers their first six bottle box, which is usually $150 for just $55. Click the link in the description to take the quiz and get started today. Thank you again to Bright Sellers for sponsoring this video. And more importantly, thank you for giving me the drive to push through this next half of horror, horror, horror. The term trad wife is a neologism, meaning that it is a newly coined phrase. But really the concept has existed for as long as traditional gender roles have. It's also a portmanteau, meaning that it's built from two different words, in this case being traditional and white. On the outside, tradwise presents a very desirable veneer. Nancy Love considers them akin to mommy blockers, who instead of dreaming up a beige black hole to live in, extols a 50s escapist fantasy of chastity, marriage, and motherhood. 
From my days of scrolling through the tradwife hashtag, I began to build the prototype of the average tradwife and her content. There are fantasies of middle to upper class lifestyles, old world clothing, ranging from prairie to 50s housewife, cottagecore, baking, crunchy lifestyles, country music, 50s advertisements, and the idea of true womanhood, which we've covered time and time again on this channel. The tradwife seems largely harmless, she cares about her family and she bakes cookies for her husband. There's nothing wrong with that. Interestingly enough, she's typically white, cis, and financially comfortable enough to lead the lifestyle she's romanticizing to hundreds of thousands of people. Though there are black trad wives, there are many more black housewives who refrain from participating in the trad wife or even trad life hashtags for a myriad of reasons. If they do post traditional housewife content or refer to themselves as a housewife or stay at home mom, it's usually done through the lens of black girl luxury rather than conservative cottagecore. That isn't to say that black women can't be aligned with biblical submission or quite frankly, conservative viewpoints of gender because trust and believe some are. And so now obviously Taylor has instantly become best friends. It's so easy to become best friends. She's about it and she's a copy. You love each other instantly at the age of 34. You have no questions and her and Brittany Mahomes are not best friends. Brittany Mahomes are not best friends. So funny, her name's on the team too. Oh yeah, I'm actually married to the star quarterback, Patrick Mahomes. Let's be best friends. Yeah, sure. Let's make sure we're, we're in the paparazzi all the time and show them that we're best friends because we're gonna hold hands. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Her and Brittany Mahomes who just met one week ago, Taylor, new beau that she's been seeing for a couple of weeks. They are now holding hands everywhere they go. And it's cringe. It should make you cringe. It should make you question why she acts like this. Two 34 year old women do not hold hands after they just meet. Trust me, how do I know? I'm a 34 year old woman. Here she is holding Selena Gomez's hands. Now she's out in public and she's seen in love. And so holding hands is definitely a sign, uh, you know, that this is your best friend. It just, it, I'm telling you, this is not girl behavior. Or you don't meet a woman and then instantly hold her hand a couple weeks later in public. But the way these beliefs are utilized and to what goal these beliefs are put towards differ between identities, at least for the most part. Further, there are a ton of housewives and stay-at-home moms, both online and in real life, who would not be considered trad wives, despite these surface level similarities. This divide reveals the need for a very important disclaimer. The term trad wife is used for a very specific subculture. And within this culture is a lot of moving parts. Trad wife is not an interchangeable word for housewife or someone who likes vintage clothing or even just a religious person. You have to be a combination of a lot of different things in order to be considered a trad wife, at least in the cultural conversation of the community. I think that's why so many of us get confused. Tradwife is more of an ideology than a profession or aesthetic. When I published my Toad newsletter, I got an influx of emails from you guys stating how homemaking and taking care of children means a lot to you and how you want to be able to share that love online but find it impossible to do so because you don't want to be compared to trad wives. I have loads of respect for stay-at-home moms and homemakers. I've had the pleasure of knowing some who are truly the best, most loving people I've ever met, who maintain the home, raise their children, and sometimes even on top of that, have a full-time job. And it's not just mothers. There have been an array of stay-at-home fathers on social media who document their lifestyle. But while these groups all do the same thing on the surface, some trad wives have different goals. Let's refrain from generalizing. I know, it's impossible for me too. But let's say that from this point forward, when I say trad wife, I'm speaking specifically to politically conservative trad wives. If it doesn't apply to you, cool. These trad wives are distinguishable by their politics. Politics, might I add, that are hidden within their aesthetic content. Tradwives take the average elements of housewifery and homemaking to another level through gender essentialism, biblical femininity, homophobia, xenophobia, anti-Semitism at times, racism at times, and conservative values. They're usually anti-feminist, some of them have hatred for the government, some of them don't believe in science, and some of them participate in a crunchy lifestyle. At the heart of it, these trad wives believe in what they call biblical submission. They want to serve their house and husband, as well as kids if they have any. Nancy Love argues that trad wives use their aesthetic of hyper-traditional femininity to mask the authoritarianism of their ideology. Instead of being kin to the average mommy blogger who is decidedly silent on politics, Tradwives are considered 
white nationalist mommy bloggers. Their beliefs are typically conservative, which on the surface makes sense. Conservatism is usually defined by a rejection of change and an embracement of tradition. But the trad wives online tend to skew even more right. Sophia Sykes et al. studied 36 trad wives on social media over a 10-month period. Their goal was to determine the community's relationship to right-wing pipelines. To document their findings, the author constructed the trad wife landscape, which consists of three ideological sectors, the conservative right trad wives, the alt-light trad wives, and the alt-right trad wives. The conservative trad wife is where most trad wife content starts. They support conservative gender roles in politics, such as serving the house and family, presenting a biblically feminine lifestyle, and placing an emphasis on homemaking and homeschooling. On the other end of the spectrum, alt-right trad wives are those that place less emphasis on feminine content and homesteading, though that certainly makes its appearance, and more emphasis on spreading alt-right ideology, like anti-feminism and white nationalism. The alt-light trad wife is merely a bridge between the two extremes, one that outsiders may pass through with little notice or care. Alt-light trad wives, as Sykes et al. state, are broadly aligned with beliefs of the alt-right, but do not vocally subscribe to white supremacy, instead projecting the continuation of Eurocentric culture as opposed to the continuation of the white race. Outside of these three main structures are smaller identity bubbles, which may intersect with one another. There are religious trad wives who participate in biblical femininity, which is actually most of them, political trad wives who defend and uphold right-wing conservatism while also denigrating feminism and other perceived leftist liberal lies. There's militia trad wives who have a concerning obsession with guns. And then there's counterculture trad wives who are extremely right-wing and have a very vocal kink about being bred by a white masculine man. Regardless of what umbrella these people fall under, these trad wives serve a great purpose. They're typically skilled social media influencers who use the algorithm to their advantage. They avoid posting anything that might get them deplatformed, but are masters at outrage farming. On platforms like TikTok and Meta, trad wives promote their beliefs while still maintaining a palatable, desirable, and attainable veneer of femininity and aesthetics. These platforms are used to build and maintain engaged audiences. On less regulated platforms like the dark web or TikTok, <laughs> trad wives engage in more ideological posting. They share their views and they attempt to red pill their followers into rabbit holes. On these platforms, Sykes et al. argue, trad wife followers are offered in-group association and parasocial relationships with the intention of strengthening right-wing community membership and legitimizing extreme religious, political, and ideological positions. In other words, the trad wife community serves as a right-wing pipeline best exemplified by the trad wife landscape. Viewers, and even new trad wife content creators, begin in the conservative landscape and are slowly pushed to more extremes. According to Sykes et al., it's very rare for trad wives to encourage left to right radicalization, though it certainly can happen. But it's more likely for trad wives to start off appealing to mostly right wing audiences in the first place with both the creator and viewers shifting toward deeper radicalization. Noelle Cook has been documenting the rise of alt-right content on social media and notes how certain trad wives hide dog whistles or supremacist messaging within their aesthetic content. Cook notes that between the hashtags homemaking and traditional wife, she once saw a user in the trad wife community use the hashtag revolt against the modern world. This is a reference to a right-wing book by Julius Evola, a known Nazi and fascist. Some trad wife content is even tagged with references to the Unabomber, who was a domestic terrorist that believed that the advancement of technology was disastrous for the human race. The deeper you go into the pipeline, the more you begin to see posts about 
anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, anti-vaccination, a rejection of government on all levels, a perpetual distrust in science, the belief in white purity, an aestheticized disapproval of race mixing, and a confusing dose of misogyny. Whereas the alt-right pipeline headed by men starts off rough around the edges, owning and poning liberal losers, the alt-right pipeline headed by women serves as an attempt to soften and normalize the ideology, as argued by Nancy Love. Tradwives are aesthetic professionals. Their content is more or less indiscernible from others in the cottage core or soft life subcultures. But their participation in right-wing politics, most likely in support of their more than likely right-wing husbands, mirror the historical attendance of white women within white supremacist circles. Like the clans women who ironed pointy hats and organized festivities for their violent husbands, who spread their family's ideology at potlucks and social gatherings, the modern trad wife spreads her conservative or otherwise alt-right ideology to hundreds of thousands of people on the internet. And for the record, I'm not calling all trad wives KKK affiliates. I'm simply pointing out the similarities between the pipeline found in the trad wife community and the pipeline found in the 20s WKKK. If the state of white women in conservative movements are of any merit today, trad wives are not simply baking their husband's cookies and staying out of business. They are just as ingrained into the cause, if not from a physical place, than from a secretarial position. For instance, Wolfie James is a woman married to an alleged white nationalist, and she said that the alt-right men in their intoxicating masculinity are better suited for the cause, while the women who support these men boost it to the next level. Lana Lochtef, another auxiliary in the movement, said in 2016, when women get involved, a movement becomes a serious threat. How very girl boss. Lotkev seems to be a recruiter of sorts. She commands an audience on YouTube alongside her husband. And in speaking to Say Word Darby, stated that the key to getting white women to join the alt-right movement is to instill fear. We have a joke in the alt-right, she says. How do you red pill someone? Have them live in a diverse neighborhood for a while. You have a higher chance of being hate crimed by Jeffree Star, and judging by his track record, I'm pretty sure he's not in a diverse neighborhood. Mm, I'm motherfucking ghetto, so what? I mean, come on. Do I have to teach you how to make racist jokes now too? If you're going to try to offend me, the least you could do is be funny with it. Put some effort into your crowd, strengthen that punchline. Overall, what white women bring to the current alt-right movement is similar to what they brought to the 20s KKK or any other white supremacist cause. They bring numbers. That makes the rise and popularity of trad wives on the internet so concerning. You can argue, which I'm sure you will in the comments, that not every trad wife is a white supremacist. Not all of them seek to recruit people into scary groups. I mean, one has even gone out of her way to denounce white supremacy, stating that a fringe group of trad wives tarnish the image of the subculture. And all she wants to do is share her lifestyle. And that's fair. I, <laughs> I don't think every trad wife believes in white nationalism. I don't think every trad wife is a neo-Nazi. I don't even think every trad wife is married to one. But as Sittler Ebel states, while most followers of this campaign are not adamant supporters of the alt-right, the desire for a specific tradition is intrinsically preferential and exclusive and subtly supports these white supremacist agendas. Even the ones that are oh so wholesome, they're just like super wholesome videos, still are extremely conservative. They post in support of or show love to content that is anti-immigration, pro-Trump, pro-gun, anti-LGBT, especially anti-trans. They willingly platform right-wing and far-right personalities, even going so far as expressing love for those personalities. But if you really spend time with it, 
um, and you look at some of these, you know, Instagram accounts or TikToks, what you'll realize is it's as much about what it's against as what it's for. I'm feminine, not feminist, right? And so seeding these ideas that, you know, you want to be like me, um, you know, look how great my life is. Children love me, men love me. Like, look how celebrated I am in comparison to right you'll start to see the ways in which being trad is also about being anti something not just pro-tradition but anti-progress and they are extremely good at creating echo chambers of discounting an argument simply because they view it as coming from someone who is a feminist or a left-leaning individual these are the perfect conditions to create a pipeline whether trad wives intend to or not their politics serve as a starting point for alt-right radicalization. Vulnerable viewers are able to start off in a tame environment where they watch trad wives speak about homeschooling their children in order to fight against wokeness or the dangers of feminism. And those trad wives create a bond with their audience. It doesn't hurt that their aesthetic is so disarming either, or as Brett Cooper called it, super wholesome. Politically conservative trad wives begin sharing more right-wing content, linking to right-wing personalities, funneling their viewers deeper and deeper until they're unable to parse reality from racism. This is what happened with Dylan Roof. Though his radicalization came from websites largely run by white nationalist men, he still spiraled toward an unreturnable frenzy of hatred that the alt-right as a whole fed, even if they claim that they're not responsible. Not all tradwives are explicitly white supremacists, but a great portion of them do serve as pipelines to white supremacist communities. To ignore this is dangerous. To try to justify it is Silly. I mean, the evidence is right there. <laughs> I have sources at the end of every video if you don't believe me. But you are a bunch of jesters, aren't you? Well, good, because I can play devil's advocate too. Okay, say that you believe in the pipeline. You're one of my very smart viewers. You agree that trad wives, even if they are not explicit white supremacists, begin as a sort of starting point for far-right content, but, but you kind of get why people want to join the movement. I mean, trad wifery seems comfortable. It's all baking and backyard teaching and kissing your partner when they come home from work. The spoils of capitalism have beaten you down, have essentially killed you, and you are expected to get up and go to work the next day anyways? How unfulfilling that life is. How utterly unfair it is to watch other people live your dream of baking a sweet little pie and cooling it on the windowsill. The countryside unfolding and rolling towards you on the horizon. Cows and chickens and little red-cheeked babies playing just within your eyesight. <sighs> to be a trad wife is to be saved from the evils of a man's world. I mean, they have returned to the biblical prophecy of female submission. They are entirely supported by their husbands, completely dependent on that one check destined forever to cook, clean, and kneel for another. Wait, that doesn't sound like something I want, actually, what the fuck? This was the leading counter argument I saw about the trad wife community, right behind choice feminism. And I get why it's so popular. I too want to spend my days baking and doing laundry and making my house into a home. But that's the thing. What you truly want is a dissolution of the capitalist system, not to become a trad wife. You want a life that doesn't require you to work until your bones break, where you can get rejuvenating rest and have fun with your friends and take your time without constantly providing labor for someone else. You want to be able to survive off of one income. You want to be able to own a house to home make in that isn't ruled by a skeevy landlord. You want liberation. Not only is that 
not going to happen under alt-right rule in general. Girl, it's not even happening under democratic rule. Women are mistaking wanting to be a trad wife and a stay-at-home girlfriend with just wanting universal basic income. Women are getting on this app and being like, I'm so tired from all this endless labor and minimal reward and these high costs of living. I wish a man would just provide for me. There is a man that should be providing for you. He should be providing for all of us. His name is Joe Biden. But it's certainly not going to be safe by trad wifery. It's much like jumping from a shark's den and into a piranha pool. You're still getting ate the fuck up regardless. <laughs> and I say this not because I think being a housewife is oppressive, but because the politics of being a trad wife is. The alt-right, especially from the man's perspective, is largely anti-woman. Even if it wasn't anti-woman, vocally, it's largely anti everyone else who isn't a cis, white, heterosexual man. To pretend that you'd be safe in an environment like that simply because they haven't targeted you yet, which they have and they are and they will, is simply ignorant. Remember, if they come for me in the morning, they'll come for you at night. Do you know why Black feminists such as Angela Davis consider all oppression interleaked? Why the threat of one group is inherently tied to the threat of all others? Not only is it because hatred and oppression is fluid, it's constantly moving and constantly switching its target, but because the tools and language used to oppress one group will always be recycled to oppress another. Think about the language that alt-right men use against white women and compare it to the scientific racism that white people use against black people. As written by Jean Belkier, females could never become emotional or intellectual adults. Therefore, their roles in society had to be limited. Spencer 1975 advised that women be barred from competition with males. Women would merely disrupt the smooth operation of society. They belong in the home and should be forced to stay there. If women are subordinate to men, it is because they are inferior to men and nothing should be done to upset this natural order of things. Jefferson advanced, albeit tentatively, that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstance, are inferior to the whites in the endowment both of body and of mind. Lincoln argued for that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which he believed will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. Alt-right men state that women should never be allowed into politics. They should never be allowed into leadership positions. Frankly, they shouldn't even be allowed to work the same jobs as a man. And it's not because they hate these women, they argue, but because women are just fundamentally and biologically different from men. The same argument has been made by white people who support the idea that black people are fundamentally and biologically different from them, which in their eyes justified slavery, justified subjugation, and justified the continued discrimination against black people. The language of scientific racism is the same language of scientific misogyny. And the goal is much the same too, to maintain domination and hierarchy over people deemed biologically inferior. If women were truly safe in the alt-right movement, how do we explain the Klan's behavior in the 1800s and 1900s? The Klan brutalized black women, assaulted them, burned down their houses, bombed their churches, and they killed them. Despite being women, a social class that the Klan considered protected, countless black women were harmed. Surely, you can argue that white women were the protected class, not women of color. But then, even poor white women were considered enemies. There was one impoverished white woman who was living with a black man at the time who was sexually mutilated by the Klan. A white woman, a woman that if she had been of a different financial status, if she had not been caught with a black man, would have been considered protected from the Klan's wrath. But ugh, it's, it's middle to upper class white women who are protected, not poor white women, not women of color. You mean the upper to middle class white women without incomes of their own? 
who could be left destitute by their husbands without a moment's notice, who were largely confined to the house, unworking and entirely dependent upon their husband's paycheck in the early 1900s, those middle to upper class women are, let's pivot. Let's consider Mary Elizabeth Tyler, a white woman who was integral to the success of the second clan. Not only did she recruit thousands of people to the cause, she also owned the clan's newspaper. She organized for the clan, and she even gained wealth for her services. Mary Elizabeth Tyler was extremely successful and quite bright. She was the one who expanded the clan's bigotry to further include Jewish people, Catholic people, Asian people, and immigrants. And this allowed, sorry, it's not funny. This allowed prospective members to choose their favorite bigotry, so to speak, which led to larger recruitments. Yet the threat she posed against other groups like Jewish people and black people did not save her from being discarded by the Klan herself in 1923. As Sayward Darby states, Tyler was ultimately pushed out in part because the men in the movement were threatened by her strength and her power. Mary Elizabeth Tyler's downfall came because liberation is not solved by individualism, which is ultimately the politics of the alt-right and trad wifery. Selfishness is a recipe for isolation and cold exclusion, and it never works out for the people who do it. It's not that white women in the trad wife movement are safe, from the same fate they wish upon other groups. It's just that these white women are useful right now to carry out the alt-right's goal. That is preserving the white race through marriage and childbirth. The moment they become unuseful, so to speak, the moment they become too loud or too opinionated or too threatening, will their safety hold? As the saying goes, if one of us is in danger, all of us are in danger. This is because the person aiming the target at us is not sure why they're angry or at whomst they're angry. Really, they're just angry at themselves because of a perceived failure, but they can't admit that. So they aim that hatred of themselves at anyone who looks the least like them as to not get caught. And that's the core message espoused by the trad wives, the inherent differences between them and white men. What happens when they become a threat? Before we get ready to go, I'd like to read some Toe mail about this topic. Toe is a newsletter whose title stands for Tragedy and Errors. I don't know why it was so hard to say that sentence. With every post, I give my subscribers a chance to share their thoughts on the topic. If you want to get included in a future Toe segment, make sure to subscribe to my Substack for free, which is linked in the description. Anonymous user states, I wish the Tradwife community was more welcoming and less tied to far-right views and mentalities. I want to be a stay-at-home mom one day who takes care of my children and husband, but it's extremely discouraging when the only people online I see doing that have such white supremacist views. Being able to provide a nurturing and healthy lifestyle for my family is something I aspire to do one day, and I feel in some ways that it's my life's mission. But as a queer person, I wish there was a community for women slash femmes who want a more traditional lifestyle that don't have to feel like they're constantly being targeted. Julie says, I want to be a stay-at-home mom so bad. It is currently my biggest aspiration. Trad wives, though, it kind of baffles me that their content is so right-wing. Stay-at-home parents thrive the best when they're supported financially, and right now it is very difficult to support a family on one person's salary alone. It would almost seem logical to me that trad wives may be a little less traditional. But the thing is, racism isn't logical. The trad wife community represents this deep-seated idealism about the old ways, which is just code for BIPOC suppression. White women will often be very happy to sit comfortably in sexism so long as they aren't treated as badly as people of color and dress it up like the ideal life. It is romanticize your life taken to the worst extreme. And lastly, Fine states, trad is a sort of pushback a reaction, if you will, against changing gender relations and frustrated heterosexuality for her. <laughs> we generally struggle with making sense of conservatism among younger women because it's seemingly against their own interest. Feminism and female liberation will give them power, trad will not. But as always, change and rejection of the norm is scary. 
grasping onto the mantle of patriarchy in the most heightened, dramatic, tacky way will give you some temporary power. Debatably, power gleaned from sucking up to the very system that denies you freedom. By placing the bars on your own cage, you become the most prized ornament. But ultimately, it will not save you of the same fate as the quote-unquote normies. It's clear that the conversation of trad wives is undeniably linked to the conversation of white supremacy, which is why I've spent this entire video laying it bare. But as you've probably noticed, there is an even greater conversation to be had about the feminist politics of trad wifery that are messily tangled within its alt-rightness. That'll be a discussion for part two of this video series. For now though, I've got to run, girl. My cookies are burning. <laughs>